Okay, good. So we see the positive part of the solution going towards the right, negative part of the solution going towards the left, and the shock wave is now forming, right? Okay, good. But something happens after the shock wave forms, right? See this oscillation traveling upstream, this traveling upstream, right? So the central flux scheme is doing its job, but it seems it introduced uh, some kind of a non-physical oscillation that we don't expect to exist. All right. So, so first message is that it, it kind of works. So when the solution is completely uh, smooth, it, it works. The same behavior uh, we, sh we should expect. And it actually forms a shock wave, uh, which is also correct. But uh, this thing is just uh, weird, right? So we don't expect the smooth solution to behave like this. A smooth solution just uh, uh, should just uh, propagate according to the characteristic. There is sh the, over here in the positive region, the characteristic is going towards the right. There is no reason anything should propagate upstream as, as what this is doing. Also, there shouldn't be anything that propagate downstream as what this is doing. All right. Any questions about the phenomenon we are observing? That one is finite volume works, and two is the central flux seems to be producing some weird oscillations. So that's what we are going to discuss next. So let's look at what these weird oscillations are like. OK. Uh, so these are kind of a grid by grid oscillation. You see like one grid up, one grid down, one grid up, one grid down, one grid up, one grid down, right? And uh, this is, uh, and it's actually not just uh, cr over here. It's all over the place. If you If you scroll up, it's it's basically uh, produced uh, all the way through the solution. And uh, even here, you see the solution is not really a smooth function. It's not a continuous, right? So why is this happening? This didn't happen before the shockwave forms, right? But as soon as a shockwave forms, we are s we, it seems that we are introducing a large error in the solution that it never decreases. Anybody have any guess where that error comes from? Truncation error. error, right. Because we were doing Taylor series analysis, right? Which, when a shockwave forms, it's just a not very right. Uh, it's not just very right to truncate the higher order terms because think of at the instance or just before the shockwave forms. What happens is the, the function locally becomes steeper and steeper and steeper. What we are truncating here, a second order derivative, is going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, before the shockwave forms, eventually the second order term is going to be a lot larger than the first order term, right? And the third order term is going to be much larger than the second order term. So, so what we are doing in Taylor series analysis is perfectly fine if you have a smooth solution. But once a shockwave forms, maybe this is not the correct thing to look at. I mean, Taylor series analysis. So what should we look at is, the again, the actual physics of what is happening when the shockwave forms. All right. So. What is happening when a shockwave forms is actually the shockwave forms a discontinuity, right? So, so remember last time when we uh, plot the when we plot the space time plot, where we draw, for example, in the solution we just uh, solved. Initially, we have a sinusoidal curve, and uh, uh, the Partial f, partial u, which is the speed of the characteristics, is just equal to u. So when u is equal to 0, the characteristic travels upward. right? The slope of the characteristic is, is the reciprocal of the characteristic speed. And over here, the characteristic travels upstream, uh, downstream. And over here, the characteristic travels uh, uh, upstream. 
So we have a bunch of characteristics converging into here. That's why we have a shock wave. And here is like this. Okay, so we have a shock wave here. And uh, in, in the case uh, we just saw, it is a, it's a special case where the shock wave is stationary, but in general, the shock wave would move, right? And when the shock wave moves, the shock wave is a very interesting thing. Things, it's, it's like a black hole. The characteristics disappear in the shock wave and nothing ever comes out, right? I mean, there is, there is no characteristic that comes out of the, the, the shock wave. So what happens is that when you discretize the solution around the shock wave, is it really proper? For example, if you want to construct a, the interface here, so this is i plus half, and this is i, this is i plus one. So once you, if you want to construct the, the flux here, and let's imagine a special case where, where, the, uh, where this interface is exactly on the shock wave, is it proper to look across the shock wave for what value we should use? Right. Actually, no, because the other side of the shock wave should not affect this side of the shock wave, right? Because all the information they disappear into the shock wave, so no information on the other side of the shock wave should be affecting this side. The shock wave is like a wall. Uh, what I if I say something it disappears into the shock wave. It doesn't go to the other side. The other side uh, of the shock wave, if it says something, you know, whatever it says is going to go into the shock wave and disappear. So I, across the shock wave, no information actually gets transferred for scalar conservation law. Okay. So that's, that's what happens. If we use a central flux reconstruction scheme, the problem is that we will be using half of the information from the other side of the discontinuity. So, so a central flux scheme is like, I have a value here, I have a value here, then I have a shock wave, the next value here, the next value here. When I'm trying to reconstruct the flux here, I'm actually using both sides, which is actually not physically correct. 